Welcome back. You're watching the full view on this Heritage Day edition. Uh, Heritage Day on this, uh, the 24th of September 2021, um, yearly even recognizes and celebrates the cultural wealth of our nation. Now, South Africans celebrate or observe the day by remembering the cultural heritage of the many cultures that make up the population of South Africa. Various events are staged throughout the country to commemorate this day. Living heritage is said to be the foundation of all communities and an essential source of identity and continuity. Living heritage plays an important role in promoting cultural diversity, social cohesion, reconciliation, peace and economic development. But the question we're asking is, having said all of this, South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. Have our differences alienated us from each other, from becoming one nation? We're joined now by Terry Oakley-Smith, Managing Director at Diversity. And uh, hopefully joining us in a moment will be former TRC Commissioner Yasmin Suka. Terry, let me start with you. So South Africa is experiencing the influences of both globalization and internationalization, as we've seen. Numerous challenges abound as well by cultural diversity, including language, religion, race, and gender issues. But how has this impacted on the transformation agenda as we reflect on Heritage Day? You know, I think we still, after all these years, have a lot to do at Tepiso in terms of the issue of transformation. Um, I work in many organizations who are still struggling to come to terms with it. And obviously, the, the difficulties uh, for organizations regarding transformation um, center around the inequality that you've mentioned already, um, the inequality um, that still persists in South Africa. And in fact, when you look at issues of unemployment, we see that in terms of particularly African youth, it's got even worse, the unemployment. So I think there's a, a, a huge amount of work for us to do still. And certainly we can't sit back on our laurels. Um, and I really don't feel that we've achieved very much. Mm. And, and let's talk about uh, those achievements or assumptions thereof. We've uh, often portrayed ourselves as a rainbow nation. We've been known uh, to be that. But uh, are there any, any indications that we've reached some modicum of uh, balance in equality or recognition of the many different uh, cultures and communities that make South Africa, especially in modern day political South Africa? My view um, is that, you know, I think it was a great idea to, to coin the phrase rainbow nation, um, <clears throat> but unfortunately we're not there. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't get there. Um, but, but I think it behoves all of us. And I do think as white South Africans, we have a particular responsibility. When we look at the past, when we look at the years of apartheid and before that of, of colonialism, um, I think we have a particular part to play. And I think we need to, um, if, we, if we want to live in this country and be part of this country, we have the challenge of, playing our part in actually building a rainbow nation, because certainly we don't have a rainbow nation as things stand. Many South Africans know very little about each other. Maybe on a heritage day, they see people wearing their um, particular cultural attire and, you know, nod. Very few white South Africans speak an African language, for example. Um, we also know very little about other cultures. I mean, there are many South Africans who have a legacy of enslavement, who were brought here as slaves. Both um, many Muslim families have that legacy, and also Indians who were brought, to, South Africans of Indian descent, who were brought here as indentured workers. So we have a rich, a very rich heritage, but somehow or other, we're not seeming to be able to explore it adequately. All right. We are joined now by former TRC commissioner and human rights uh, expert and activist Yasmin Suka. A very good evening to you, uh, Yasmin. I hope you don't mind us uh, staying on the first name basis. Thank you so much for uh, speaking to us. So talk to us about 
We're talking about diversity, we're talking about inclusion, minding the gap, the historical history and context of South Africa. What are your views? I mean, uh, Terry here speaking about uh, on days like this, there's recognition of each other's individual cultural rights and heritage. But we are still seeing daily on our screens, for instance, uh, a young black girls still fighting to be able to wear their hair uh, in a natural way at school. And I know from my own experience, just even speaking one's own language was something that will be sending you to detention because that cannot be spoken. We know that English is regarded as the language of business in South Africa, so you are uh, not behaving in a professional manner when you uh, differ from that. Thank you and good evening to your listeners. I think this is a really important topic for today because there, there are really a number of dimensions and maybe the mistake is that um, we all wanted to believe that we were a rainbow nation. And I think the last 25 years have really debunked the fact that unless you deal with the systemic issues, what you see on a day like this are the nice things. Um, you know, people singing together, wearing beautiful clothes. But, you know, unless we deal with the fact that systemically, um, special apartheid hasn't changed. The legacy of the poverty of apartheid hasn't changed. And we are a deeply unequal nation. We're not really going to deal with this question of plurality and diversity. And it took the riots in KwaZulu-Natal to show us at the moment there's a spot of trouble, then immediately we resort to the race game. And so I think that there's a real challenge for our government. And that is to ensure that, number one, the government is able to deliver on socioeconomic rights um, being the first priority. The second really is to really look at diversity education, both at tertiary institutions, at universities. And I think in South Africa, and for me, the one thing is what I would call critical race theory classes, which really look at this question not of diversity as a training issue, but a practice of interrogating in our society how we deal with the role of race in our society. And this is to really look at the way in which race perpetuates, um, you know, putting people at the bottom of the ladder, because we can say whatever we want to. But when you look at poverty in our country, you look at inequality, it is deeply racialized mm -hmm. and it has a black woman's face. And unless we address that, we are never going to change our country. And so we can have nice songs. So, yes, Before I came on the program, mm -hmm. sorry. No, go ahead. Before you came on the program. You know, before I came, I was listening to Jerusalem and I was thinking about how this has united the world. But, you know, when you think about it, we have to go beyond the song and the dance and the clothing. And we have to say systemically what is wrong with our country. How do we learn about each other? How do we learn a black language? But how do we understand each other and where we come from? Because the moment we have a problem, we lift all of those veneers and we then resort to race. But, you know, in a country which is so deeply divided by poverty and inequality, how do you expect people to want to learn about the other when in many ways they still live through oppression in our country? So this is, uh, just before you came on, we were speaking about this so with, uh, uh, Terry, the fine line between uh, inequality and uh, actual diversity uh, that we can learn to appreciate. Now, I read an article earlier on which says we need to look beyond identity diversity to cognitive diversity. So how would you characterize that cognitive diversity? I know Terry was speaking earlier on about from a white woman's perspective, and we're still arguing in this country about white privilege and whether it has a role to play in our policy, uh, you know, research, development and implementation. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, it's what I would call almost a kind of unconscious bias that sometimes we take for granted that access to many layers of our lives, institutions, education, opportunities, work, 
all of that, there's an unconscious, sometimes a visible bias. And so I think that what we need really is an acknowledgement that racism is a normal feature of our society and it's become embedded within systems and institutions. And while we might have got rid of legal apartheid, at a substantive level, it still exists. And you talked about the incident of a young girl's hair, the question of speaking your language, sending you to detention. And then I think we also have to reject the notion that racism is only about a few bad apples. It is about systemic and institutional embedding. And unless we understand that, we're never going to deal with it. And the other thing is we've got to recognize what South Africa's experiences are and the relevance of that to our everyday lives. Do we actually know how the other lives? Do we know, you know what it takes to come to work? I think when you look at you know, South Africa and you look at the lockdown, you look at COVID, this has laid all the fault lines in our society bare. And while it's wonderful today, I mean, we're celebrating a book that was launched on the Khoi and the San language. You have the literature, the Children's Literature Foundation having mm. won the UNESCO prize. You have the interfaith community doing vaccination drives today, but you also have the two cases that came through yesterday. The UNISA one in the Concord on the use of Afrikaans, and then you have this question of the tourism fund. And you kind of wonder, how do we sensitize our society okay. to the fact that racism is institutionalized? So, Terry, that's exactly it. Diversity is about a wide range of characteristics seen and not seen. And, and please tell me about from your own personal perspective, how do we recognize what isn't always visible in people and embrace this difference by actively including people who or think differently and who have differing viewpoints and skill set. And, and this is uh, across the race uh, uh, you know, spectrum as well because there's also ethnic differences where people feel they're not seen because traditionally they are seen of a lower um, taste, so to speak. Yes, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And what you said earlier, Sapiso, about the need... Um, to approach this work or the work that we do um, from a critical race theory point of view. I mean, I think diversity has been in many ways quite damaging because, you know, in many instances it's been very trivialized and we haven't really gotten um, to, to the heart of what the issues are around diversity in South Africa. And the fundamental issue in South Africa is the issue of race. Um, and I think that you know, if we were to do more education, not only in universities, but also in schools and organizations, churches, etc., cetera, um, the education should be on anti-racism. Um, I think that's a, a predominantly important issue for South Africans. And when Yasmin was talking about unconscious bias, I was thinking to myself, you know, how many instances I seem to hear almost daily of conscious bias. I mean, I think in South Africa, our bias, you know, it's, not, it's a nice American term, unconscious bias, and people talking about and having lessons or workshops on unconscious bias. But surely in South Africa, we need to start with conscious bias, because, you know, that's, that's really extremely prevalent still. And I think the other thing, and it would be interesting to hear what Yasmin has to say as a, a person who was on the a commissioner for the Treaty Reconciliation Commission, I think part of the problem for us as whites is that we really got away scot-free in 1994. Now, I've been listening to a very interesting series um, on what happened um, in, at Nuremberg. And I'm not saying that we should have had a Nuremberg here, but maybe we should have had something. I mean, it's, it's as if, you know, there, there, there was apartheid for all those years, colonialism before... And we can just carry on as we, we always were. We, uh, land has been taken from people. Pride has been taken from people. Jobs have been taken from people. And yet there has never been um, a time where there's been a call, a serious call for reparation or even acknowledgement mm. or even apology. I mean, there's been nothing. We, we carry on as we always did, and in some ways even better than we always did. Terry, I'm glad you raised that because, Yasmin, it's been often said that South Africa led the way in 
terms of this restorative justice, but if you look at the Gachacha courts in Rwanda, for instance, and uh, that same model in Uganda, that it seems to have achieved far more than South Africa. Why is that? I think there are two things. The one is that, um, you know, what we should never discount is the fact that the compromise was seen as a necessary sacrifice. But the way in which it was defined was that if you did not come forward and talk, you know, speak the truth, or if you were refused, um, you know, amnesty because you did not make full disclosure, then the law should follow its course. Now, the last 23 years have seen us, together with families of victims, really try to get the state and the NPA to act against those who bear criminal responsibility for the crimes they've committed. And because they haven't, there's this perception, really, that you can get away with anything in South Africa. The second issue is, of course, that, you know, my late colleague who, um, you know, Klingiwe Mkize, brought together a group of experts who designed probably one of the best reparation programs in the world. But you know what happened when the Mbeki administration took over? They decided to ditch that and do their own thing. And of course, in the 23 years since then, they have not paid every single victim reparations, and neither have they dealt with community reparations, and they've not dealt with this question of an apology. And even the leader of the apartheid government at the time, until last year, President de Klerk, in fact, resisted the idea of ever accepting that apartheid was a crime against humanity, and that, in fact, the apartheid state had become a criminal state which set up death squads to take out people. Now, you know, when you go to different war-torn countries, and I think both Uganda and, of course, Rwanda are cases in point, the Gachacha courts were absolutely critical because they had such millions of people really in prison that they had to find a way to deal with it. But one of the challenges in Rwanda today is if you have a different narrative hmm. to that of the government, and then, of course, the intolerance creeps in. And I would say that probably in South Africa, the problem is, you know, we had a number of meetings with South African corporations. And I was struck when they told me, well, we were victims of apartheid too. And I said, well, actually, the only the only way you can seek any kind of absolution, really, is if you pay into reparations yeah. fund. And we anticipated that that's what the government would make them do, but they let them off the hook. And I suppose the point you're making is that harmonious and uh, prosperous coexistence is uh, transient from one era to the next. Thank you so much to you both. And it's such a pity that we have run out of time, but much appreciated your time and your insights. Terry Oakley-Smith, Managing Director, Diversity, and former TRC Commissioner and human rights expert and activist, Yasmin Suka.